Um, Walker flew together on their first space missions, and um, I'm sort of wondering what Malin must have thought about flying with a civilian astronaut. Nowadays, we're hearing all about civilian astronauts, but back then that was kind of a brand new thing. So, could you both maybe elaborate on that flight and that experience and how you guys uh, work together? Well, I was, uh, anybody's read my book, know I was kind of suspicious of anybody that didn't come from the same background that I did, military, you know, aviator, I was a backseat fan, so it took a while for me to uh, get my head around the fact that all of these people, the, the women, uh, the payload specialists, brought, brought as much to the table as I, I possibly could, in many cases, a lot more than I could. Uh, so it took me a while, but, but I, I certainly uh, adapted and uh, realized, hey, yeah, this is part of the program, these guys are great, these women are great, and uh, let's fly in space. So uh, I, it took a while, but yeah, I got there. Uh, Charlie, you want to comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, just ignore everything that Mike just said. <laughs> no, actually, uh, the truth is that uh, I, I, I was uh, late covered to the mission. The uh, the agency hadn't decided, uh, as these guys had been in training for, as the zoo crew, for, gosh, a couple of years before our first manifest of launch date in, like, March of 84. Uh, and so, actually, the payload, I was flying with a payload. It wasn't like a payload was flying with me. The whole idea of the payload specialist thing was that uh, somebody had some expertise on a experiment research and R&D project, a payload that NASA wanted to see flown for whatever reason. Mine was commercially oriented with the, the company I was employed with and, and was the chief test engineer for on this uh, technology. And NASA wanted to see this payload flown. It manifested it uh, with the capabilities of the mission of a particular mission to match. Ended up on 41D. JR, Judy Resnick, was first assigned and said, uh, well, you know, she's, she should be the one that operates this on our, our mission. This was before I, the, the agency had said, yes, a payload specialist can be assigned to go along with this. Now, this wasn't the first flight of my payload, CFES, CFES, uh, because I had trained uh, three other crews prior to that uh, time to operate the experiment uh, in orbit and uh, so uh, it was I thought we thought for a while that this was going to be a fourth flight with an uh, MS or two operating and a uh, mission specialist uh, professional astronaut corps but the agency at headquarters finally got uh, uh, to the decision made the decision okay ES can, can uh, be on board and then they told JSC this and then Glenn Lunny and passing on down the line George Abbey and onto the corner office in building four, uh, uh, that uh, you're gonna do this, and then the head started scratching like, well, wait a minute, how are we gonna do this? We, we haven't done this kind of PS before, this is not a space lab mission, this is different. And um, so, scratching, I was, I was the first out of the box in this category of payload specialist, and uh, they basically did the syllabus uh, around, uh, wrote the syllabus as I was going along for training of a, a crew member. And uh, Judy, uh, uh, as gracious as she was, and of course we all agree with that term, she was gracious, right? She was. Uh, <laughs> Judy, Judy was she wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she was my uh, then my backup as I was training to operate uh, that with the crew. Now I only knew, already knew how to operate, and I was learning how to work with the crew. And Hank and the zoo crew uh, were just extraordinary. Uh, welcoming to me. I'm sure a lot of the conversations that went on in the office when I wasn't there were most mm -hmm. interesting to, uh, to hear, if one could hear them. But uh, I, I, I think I worked out well enough that uh, it's pretty clear that at least NASA management said, well, uh, this has got to fly again to continue the research that McDonnell Douglas is doing toward uh, a pharmaceutical product made in space, and PS has to operate it, uh, then you know, this guy looks like he's qualified. And as my third commander, uh, Brewster Shaw, later said to me and the public, he said, well, after the zoo crew ringed him out, he was a known quantity, so uh, we think we can fly with him again. Uh, but uh, this was an extraordinary uh, mission. It was, uh, I don't think it's been mentioned yet, that 
41D was the first flight of that particular orbiter, uh, OB-103 Discovery. And so it was a, an interesting mission in that regard. And of course, our launch date slipped, as slips happen quite frequently in those days. Uh, it went from March into uh, to June. We ended up on the launch pad uh, and got down to T-1, T-31 uh, seconds. Peters took over uh, on that launch, uh, prospective launch date on the 26th of June, 84. And um, the, uh, the three engines were started up in sequence, except, no, wait a minute, number two engine didn't quite uh, meet the computer's uh, tolerances, and so there was a redundant set uh, launch sequence or uh, shutdown. The first on pad abort in the shuttle program on the pad at T minus two and a half seconds. So um, we. Uh, that got our attention that way. <laughs> <laughs> that got our attention. I was down here at the KR, the rest of the crew was uh, upstairs on the flight deck. And uh, of course, we were all listening to the, uh, the headsets. It was an interesting circumstance. Mike, you ought to relate more about that. Yeah, when those engines started, I, we practiced the uh, abort uh, getting out of the cockpit on a dry town about, I don't know, two or three weeks before the actually going out there to launch. So it wasn't like we hadn't done this before, but when you get down to those final seconds like that, at least I know in my brain, I wasn't thinking when those engines started, you get that heavy rumble in the cockpit, I, I thought we're going, you know, this is it, for better or worse, we're going. And uh, then when all of a sudden they stopped, that really, you know, was a, a shock. And when they mentioned the word fire, uh, shortly thereafter, that oh. really opened our eyes. <laughs> I do recall Holly, I looked over at Holly and, uh, you know, his eyes were the biggest saucer, so I knew I was looking in a mirror. And he said, I thought we'd be higher when the engines quit. <laughs> 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 we uh, we had strapped in the cockpit uh, and prepared to do the emergency ground escape and uh, Judy was downstairs and uh, I remember her, I don't know if she got, we all unstrapped from our seats but didn't get out of them, at least upstairs, I don't know if you guys downstairs did, but I remember Judy asking Hank on the intercom if she should open the, uh, the hatch so we'd be ready to run out and he said no, sit there, close. Did, you, did she get out of her seat when she had the hatch? Okay. All right, well, uh, fortunately, she... Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, it's really, it, well, you can't see behind it, and it, it also, it just, it, there was a, some confusion initially on what was happening, and you heard, of, you know, that break, break, we see engine number two still running, and, and uh, we knew nothing was running, or if it was, there was something really wrong, because we weren't feeling any vibrations up there. The reason we, we had a, a red light on the instrument panel uh, for the two that had shut down, or no, I can't remember now, is it two? Yeah, the check down or, yeah, but anyway, uh, yeah, there was one light that wasn't on, Mike Ghost uh, was hitting that shut down button, trying to trying to turn off a engine we knew wasn't running, but it turned out it never went into the start sequence, so it never, you know, it never shut down. So, uh, you yeah, know, that was, it was just seemed like a little bit of confusion there with what was happening, and hearing the break, break, you know, that really, you know, <laughs> also gets your attention. <laughs> But it all uh, worked out. We uh, sat tight for uh, LCC's instruction, and they brought out, they turned on the fire suppression system, which deluged the pad, got the fire out. And it was it wasn't on the vehicle; it was on some uh, uh, ground support equipment that was at the bottom of the of the pad there. That's what. It, but it was burning up. It, it looked like the vehicle was burning on, on fire there, but it wasn't. Um, but it did support some areas underneath the engine area. But uh, they got that out and uh, came out and extracted this the normal way. And, and uh, Judy Resnick's hair took a significant hit from the from the deli. You know, she looked like a, a ground ground cat walking in there. You know, she had that big bushy hair and all all water long. But uh, yep. And then we went off to the press conference to say, yeah, it was never any problem, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mike. I got one last word on that regard. Uh, Mike relates to uh, JR's uh, uh, appearance from the head down. What you don't relate is that as all of us walked uh, out of the van back at uh, the, the ONC building to the crew quarters, uh, the photographers took pictures of all of us wet from here on down because of the, the water in the elevator dripping down from the structure. We were all drenched. 
So there was the, uh, the expurgated photography uh, captions that said it looked like who wet themselves. <laughs> <laughs> the first launch of war, but now they have that. Right. <laughs> Thank God for your collection devices. <laughs>